this is the uh, outline that we have for the past few days, or the next few days I was talking about. So, recap of that, and this is the outline for today. I'm going to share with you Islam through the eyes of Muslims, looking at the religion of Islam, the history, the, the issue of hadith, and the law. Um, bless you. So we have currently, uh, we're going till 10 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, did, did we? That's an hour fast. Whoa, okay. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, here's what we got, and we'll start covering it. Now, when we take a look at Islam and you ask Muslims today what Islam is, especially in the West, they will give you a picture of Islam relative to what you probably already know. So you go to the Why Islam website. Now this is a website that is devoted to bringing Westerners to Islam. Uh, they have ad campaigns um, on bus lines and on trains and uh, what have you all over the nation. Um, well, in a few cities anyway. And they're getting people to look into Islam and they're doing a good job of it. Uh, here's what they say. Islam is the culmination of the universal message of God taught by all of his prophets. Muslims believe that a prophet was chosen for every nation at some point in their history, enjoining them to worship God alone and delivering guidance on how to live peacefully with others. Some of the prophets of God include Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. The prophets all conveyed the consistent divine message of worshiping one God, along with specific societal laws for each nation's circumstances. However, after the prophets delivered the divine guidance to their people, their message was lost, abandoned, or changed over time, with only parts of the original message intact. God then sent another prophet, Muhammad, to rectify their beliefs. So if you understand the way Muslims see Islam, they say, hey, we're all part of the same tradition. We're all part of the same lineage. God has sent prophets to all people over over a long, long period of time, since the inception of people, every person has had a prophet sent to them in order to guide them to the truth. All prophets taught Islam. That's what they will say. Clarifying question? Elbow itch? Yeah, elbow itch. Okay. Um, so all prophets taught Islam. Uh, over time, they started changing it to look like other things. That's why Judaism doesn't look like Islam today. That's why Christianity doesn't look like Islam today, because people changed it. Um, in addition, the original religions did not have the comprehensive message. They had portions of the message necessary for those people in those times. That is why the Jews were taught to fight under Moses. They were taught to fight because at that time fighting was necessary. Jesus was told to turn the other cheek because at his time, if they had fought the Romans, they would have been crushed. So they did not fight. Um, Muhammad came and he taught fighting is good in certain circumstances and not fighting is good in other circumstances. So Islam is the culmination of previous messages and it's what uncorrupts the previous message. It fixes it, it confirms what Allah had originally said. That is the nutshell of Islam that you will hear from a Muslim if he's gonna share Islam with you briefly. However, we have all kinds of Muslims. We have over three million Muslims in the United States. Uh, the number was in 2005. The number now is, is a bit fluctuating. Depending on where you look, you'll see numbers as small as three million. You'll see them as large as 12 million, depending on who's doing the, the survey. Um, so it's somewhere between there. It's, it's around seven, eight, nine million, somewhere around there is how many Muslims there are in the United States. But if you look worldwide, Islam is a huge phenomenon. About a quarter of the world considers himself or herself to be Muslim. That's huge, one out of four people. Um, so even if where you live in your pocket of the world, you feel like there's not many Muslims around, it's uh, probably because uh, you haven't penetrated into the Muslim circles that are in your area, especially here. I mean, especially in, where are we? No, I'm kidding. Especially in Southern California. Lots of Muslims um, in this area. So definitely what we have here, what we're talking about here, can really be used uh, in your daily life even, if you so choose to do. We feel like we're sheltered. We feel like Christianity is the status quo in the world because 237 million people, um, according to 2005 government statistics, call themselves Christian in this nation. So this is self-identification. That's about 80% of the nation would self-identify as Christian. 
Compare that to the world. In the world, we have approximately 2.2 billion Christians. That's about one third. Uh, again, these numbers are from 2005. The numbers constantly fluctuate and change. I would not be surprised one bit if by the year 2020 there are more Muslims in the world than Christians. Uh, it is growing fast, uh, mostly on account of birth rates. Muslims have far less qualms about having children um, and, than most Westerners do. Uh, my family, for example, my father's one of 10, my mother's one of six, and that's normal. Uh, my mother's family was probably a bit smaller than many other families. So lots of people having kids throughout the world. The birth rates are causing Islam to grow really, really fast. But you also do have conversions. Um, I don't know where these numbers were from, but the numbers that I have heard, so take them with a grain of salt, the numbers I've heard, 30,000 people each year in the United States convert to Islam. Um, so that's, that's large. Uh, I've also heard the number that 20,000 revert back to whatever, they leave Islam per year. So you've got a net of 10,000 of people in this nation per year convert to Islam, and that's a lot. If you wanna see, by the way, some of those conversions, just go to YouTube, type in uh, convert to Islam, or just accepts Islam, and you'll see people, and they'll be giving their reasons as to why they left whatever their faith was. Some of them are self-identifying Christians, some of them were even trying to evangelize Muslims before they left the, uh, Christ for Islam. There's actually a friend of mine here from Southern California. She went to, um, what's that church, Saddleback. Uh, she went to Saddleback and she led her whole family to the Lord. And then when she went to college, she met a Muslim and uh, she is now on the verge of converting to Islam. So this is real. Uh, there are people, there are faces behind these numbers. Um, and that's why we're here today, to talk about these things. So you have a campaign of, of people who are, who are trying to get people to accept Islam. And the Islam that they'll probably accept if they accept Islam in the West is Sunni Islam. 80% uh, of Muslims around the world are Sunni, approximately. Approximately 10 to 15% of Muslims around the world are Shia. Those are the two major denominations of Muslim. And so when you hear the words Muslim or Islam and it's unqualified, it's probably talking about Sunni Islam. But you have other sects of Islam too. You have orders of Islam, for example, Sufis. Sufis are more of an order than a sect. You can have Sufis that are Shia, Sunni, or neither. Um, you can have people who are neither, such as Ahmadis, which is again the sect that I came from. Uh, it's not Sunni, it's not Shia, but it's very close to Sunni. They follow the four uh, Khalifas, the rightly guided caliphs. They follow the Hadith that Sunnis follow. So Ahmadis are close there. Then you've got people like the Nation of Islam. Uh, you've got a group that identifies as Muslim, but they're very radically different from traditional Orthodox Islam. So Muslims of all kinds. And we gotta keep in mind that Islam is not monolithic. And people who say they are Muslim could believe any of a number of things, especially when you think about the West. Because here you've got Muslims who are growing up only having ever been exposed to Western culture. They're being exposed to critical thought. Their concept of authority isn't as strong as it is in other places of the world. And they have a different view. Um, my sister sometimes will quote Oprah when she thinks she's quoting the Quran. Um, it's just all kind of mixed in there in her head. She's not stupid, it's just that Western Islam has kind of assimilated a lot of Western culture and Western values. Uh, and we have to remember that. So the person you're sitting next to might self-identify as a Muslim and have only a slight tenuous belief in God's existence. And, and beyond that, um, you know, they just follow things that they think they're supposed to follow. One thing that you will find characteristic though is that Muslims generally are strongly adherent to their heritage. They strongly self-identify as Muslim, usually. Again, we'll be speaking in generalizations here. Uh, they might not follow Islam, they might not practice Islam, but they will defend Islam if they need to. Uh, and they'll call themselves Muslim and they will align themselves with the Islamic world, which is a very interesting phenomenon. It seeps out into other ways. Um, that is probably why you don't see as much condemnation of violent Muslims as we'd like to see. Um, Muslims in the West, a large majority of them are not violent. Um, they just want to live their lives, just like a lot of other people in the West. They just want to have kids, they want to raise their kids, they want to give them good lives, they want to leave them with a good inheritance, they want to have contributing members to society, that's what they want. But you don't see them condemning other Muslims very often because they generally align with Islam and to condemn other Muslims they feel like they'd be betraying each other. Not all of them, again, you do have Muslims that condemn violent Muslims, but a large number of them have that reticence there because they align themselves with Islam. 
So those are the basic numbers. Now when you talk to a Muslim about Islam and the practice of Islam, what they're probably going to bring up first are the five pillars of Islam. They're gonna turn first to their duties. The reason why, as we'll see tomorrow, is that Islam is based heavily, its soteriology is based heavily on duties and actions. You are supposed to perform for Allah. You're supposed to please Him. You're supposed to do things that will make Him happy because that is how you show that you are a good servant. That is how you show that you're a good slave of Allah. Um, and the term slave of Allah is literally translated Abdullah. And that's why you have so many people named Abdullah because it's a good thing to be a slave of Allah. Um, not, not too different from doulos in the New Testament, but different still in the form of it really is just an obedience out of uh, a desire to please God and not of much of a relationship with Him. So because that's what they're trying to do, they're trying to please Him, you will find a lot of focus on duties. Now the first pillar of Islam is the testimony of faith. It's called the Shahada. The Shahada is the rallying call of Muslims. This is what Muslims will say to light a fire in other Muslims' hearts. They will say the words, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This was from the earliest years of Islam, the motto, the maxim that was propagated throughout the, uh, throughout the Muslims. You see it everywhere, you see it in calligraphy. Uh, and it's beautiful, the, the calligraphy is beautiful and you'll see it in all kinds of shapes and forms. You'll see it on the flag of Saudi Arabia, right, right on top of a sword there. Um, and it is sacrosanct, these words. Uh, by saying these words, you become officially a Muslim. All you have to do is say these words. You have to recite them with intention, the intention that you actually believe it. And once you do, you're a Muslim and you cannot be disqualified from the Islamic faith uh, if you say this. Muhammad says, do not say that anyone who recites these words is not Muslim. And he gives a few exceptions, but generally speaking, this is, this is the case. Again, my parents recited this the moment I was born. They recited it into my ear the moment I was born. And Muslims are expected to recite this as they die. So as they're passing on, they're supposed to be repeating these words over and over so that angels will usher them into heaven. Literally then, Muslims' lives are encompassed by the Shahada. And throughout their lives, they're repeating this regularly, regularly. Uh, they're repeating a form of it during the Salat. They're repeating it uh, again as a rallying call. I don't know if you know or if you remember, but the World Cup, because I'm sure all of you watch international soccer. Um, the World Cup back in the 90s, uh, do you remember they've had, they had flags on, on the soccer ball? They put little flags on there and they put the Saudi Arabian flag on there. Muslims around the world went into an uproar because they're saying, you are making it so that we have to kick the Shahada. Um, and so they, they quickly changed the soccer balls, they took the Shahada off. But it means a lot to Muslims, the Shahada. That is the first pillar of Islam and the most important pillar of Islam. The next pillar and the next most important pillar is the Salat. The Salat are the five daily prayers. They're off, offered five times a day by Muslims, devout Muslims. And this is kind of the way that Muslims schedule they, their day. They kind of orchestrate their entire day around the Salat. They wake up in the morning, often on account of the call to prayer. If you've gone to the Middle East or to Pakistan or India uh, in Muslim areas, you'll hear the call to prayer. It'll wake you up in the morning from all the mosques. In fact, some of the mosques vie with one another to say the Adhan first because it's more of an honor. And so they'll be waiting for the sun to rise. And um, I remember my parents had told me, Nabil, in order to see when you can start your morning prayer, stand outside and hold a white thread. And once you can distinguish the white thread uh, through the light of the sun, uh, then it is time to say your morning prayer. And so you had people who would actually be ready to, you know, be able to distinguish just a little bit of sunlight. Oh, it's white, I'm gonna say the azan. And so that's, that's how it is in the Islamic world. And you'll hear people say, and one person starts and he's just all over the place. And it really is encompassing. It's a powerful moment if you haven't had that happen. Uh, stand in the middle of a ton of people calling to prayer. It's something else. Muslims will then take breaks during the day around the Salat. Uh, and often they will go, if they're close enough, to a mosque for every prayer, five times a day. And they pride themselves on that. They'll say, you Christians go to church once a week. We go to the mosque five times a day. Um, who do you think is more clean before God? You know, that's, that's kind of some of the polemics you'll hear um, if you get engaged in that kind of conversation. 
Another thing that they'll point out, and something that mattered a lot to Malcolm X, um, something that mattered to Cat Stevens, uh, is the discipline and the simplicity of the prayer. You have people of all kinds, of all colors, this is matter to Malcolm X, of all colors and races get, gathering together and praying side by side. Status doesn't matter, wealth doesn't matter, uh, handicap doesn't matter. You've got people of all races, of all socioeconomic levels, standing side by side, bowing down to God in discipline, all being led by an imam. They're doing it in unison. That is something that is very uh, important to Muslims, the discipline that comes through this. They'll see it as their means of worshiping God is very disciplined and orderly, uh, whereas Christians, you Christians pray uh, only in church, and which is very not true, but that's, that's what they say. Um, and uh, you do it in a very undisciplined manner, whereas we do it side by side. Um, so very interesting, very important for Muslims. Uh, a lot of Muslims will carry their prayer rugs with them, um, and they will pray out in the street. They'll pray, uh, there was a guy who tried to pray in the middle of an airplane. Um, a few uh, years ago now, I don't know if you remember that, but he got up to pray in the middle of a flight and he put down his prayer rug and everyone thought he was gonna bomb the plane. Um, which is funny, I think. I'm sure the TSA didn't like it, but I thought it was hilarious. Um, so yeah, and uh, I don't know if you've been seeing this, but uh, in France last year, the Muslims at a certain mosque have grown in number so much so that on Fridays, they've just blocked off a very important street because they pour out of the mosque and they're praying out in the streets. And uh, anytime the police tries to stop them, they'll say, you are persecuting us. And the police backs off and says, whoa, we're not about persecuting you. And so they'll just let them do their thing. Um, that's happening in France right now. All that to say, Salat is extremely important to Muslims. It's the second pillar. And without it, uh, Muslims feel very, very guilty. Um, I was, when I was a third year uh, medical student doing ob um, my chief resident at the time was a Muslim from Africa. And uh, I asked him if he was uh, fasting and praying. It was Ramadan when I was doing um, Obigain. And he said, no, I, I'm not a good Muslim. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I haven't prayed regularly and I drink every now and then and I go to the club. So I, 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 would have to, uh, I would have to change my life before I start fasting for Ramadan. Um, it was interesting, it was interesting he should say that. But the, the first thing he pointed out was that he wasn't praying regularly. Um, so it really matters to Muslims, the second pillar of Islam, Salat. The third pillar is zakat. This is a form of tithing. Um, it's uh, not called tithing because it's not 10%. It's 2.5%, um, but it's 2.5% of uh, more than what Christians would tithe off of. Uh, so they actually have a very well-developed industry on how to calculate how much zakat you should pay and uh, places you can go to do that and help getting it done and ways you can be more effective and frugal. Um, this, for example, is the Zakat Foundation of America. I pulled this off their website today. Um, you can go there to calculate how much Zakat you owe. You can go there to direct where your money will go, to what kind of ministries, to what kinds of charities. Um, and so Zakat, extremely important to Muslims. If you go to the Quran, the Quran also says that Zakat can be used for a variety of reasons, not just for the Islamic empire. Um, so for example, the Quran says Zakat can go to the traveling Wayfarer, someone's passing through your area, they need support, they need help in, on their journey, you can give your zakat to them. Uh, very interesting. You can give your zakat to help the widow and the orphan and the poor. You can give your zakat to rebuild the mosque um, or um, various issues like that. So zakat can be used for all kinds of purposes. Now one large purpose of it during Muhammad's lifetime was to support the Islamic army, to support himself, to support his family. That was a large purpose of zakat as well. So we have to remember to think of Islam in its early days as a Muslim state. And a lot of these things were done out of obedience and order for the state. And this one was to support the state. That's the third pillar of Islam. Now, by the way, a lot of people give more than that. Um, my parents, uh, my dad gave 10%, my mom gave 33%, uh, which was easy for her to do because she didn't have a job. But uh, that's, that's just what people do. The fourth pillar of Islam is fasting, psalm. Uh, it's done during the month of Ramadan, and Muslims are called to fast from sunrise to sunset. So it's not like a Christian fast, insofar as Christians usually fast for 24 hours uh, or more, and generally speaking, Christians will not give up water. Uh, Muslims do give up water, uh, but again, it's just from sunrise to sunset. 
Nothing is going to pass through their lips from sunrise to sunset. And if you go to some African countries and discuss uh, Islam and you watch some uh, African Muslims during Ramadan, you'll see that a lot of them are spitting constantly on the sidewalk. Uh, and it's, some of it's a display, but some of it's truly so that they don't accidentally swallow their spit because that would be breaking their fast. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. But this does more than just that. It also gives Muslims a social outlet. So in the morning, before, before fasting, you wake up together. It's still dark. This is before the first, the first prayer. Remember I was saying distinguishing uh, the, the white thread. Before that, we'd pray a prayer before that as a family. So my dad would wake us up. It'd be like 3 o'clock at night. He'd say, come on down for the Hajjid prayer. And I don't want to. Okay, come on down. So we'd come down for the Hajjid prayer. And... Um, he would, uh, he would recite, when, when we didn't want to get up, my sister and I, he would recite one verse of the Adhan. The, fad, the Fajr Adhan, the Adhan in the morning says, prayer is better than sleep. So he would come up to us and he'd say, prayer is better than sleep, get up. <laughs> no, it's three in the morning. And so we'd go down and we'd pray the Hajjid prayer. And then we'd, in the morning, we'd eat a lot before the fast started. And so the fast would happen after kind of a big breakfast. And my mom would make sure that we had uh, things that would keep us full for the day. So we had very heavy foods in the morning and we had yogurts and things that were very heavy. And then as the day progressed, you know, no water was probably the most difficult thing. We didn't feel hungry that much. It was the no water that was difficult, especially in school. Because, uh, you know, as a Muslim kid in the United States, you're still going to school, you're still answering questions, you're still doing PE. You know, it's very, very difficult. Um, some Muslims, by the way, uh, in, in Dearborn, Michigan, they, um, they rearranged, they got the city public schools to rearrange uh, the practice times, times for PE, etc., so that they could observe Ramadan. Um, and then at the end, after the fast, people would open the fast. So right before the Maghrib prayers, uh, you would open the fast. Usually you'd open it with a date, because that's how Muhammad did. He would eat a, a date. Um, and then you'd go pray your prayers, and then you'd go have a feast. So morning feast, nighttime feast. Not good for diabetics. Um, not good for most of you. Uh, but that's how they would do it. And it would be fun. I mean, people from all over the community would gather in the evenings. Um, for these iftar dinners, um, and we would also invite poor people to come, and you know that way you would feel like you're serving the community as well. So it was a great social outlet. It was a good time, and I suggest that if you have any Muslim friends, or if you're planning on having any Muslim friends during the month of Ramadan, it's coming up not not uh, not long. I think it's in July and August this year. Um, go and talk to them and say, hey, I would, I'd like to come to an iftar dinner, would you mind? And they'll say, no, definitely come on out. You get to learn more about their faith that way. You get to see them and they get to trust you more. Again, building trust is extremely important for any kind of relationship, especially one where you're uh, trying to show someone how to live their life before the Lord. Trust is extremely important. I would not uh, hesitate at all to go to an iftar dinner. The fifth pillar of Islam is Hajj. Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. This was practiced well before Muhammad came on the scene. People would make pilgrimages to Mecca regularly because you see that black box there in the middle? Well, it's not really in the middle. I would say it's kind of yeah. 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock there. Um, that's called the Kaaba. That is considered to be the house of God that was built by Abraham, according to Muslims. Abraham built that. And since that time, according to Muslims, people have been traveling to the Kaaba to worship, to pay homage. Before Muhammad's time, though, polytheists had come and they had set up idols around the Kaaba, 360, one for every day um, on their calendar. And people from all over Saudi Arabia would come and they would pay homage to those idols, depending on which idol was theirs. And so because of that, Mecca became a center for trade. Since people were coming from all over, they would meet there and they would trade there. So the Kaaba, the pilgrimage, very important to the uh, DNA of this city. There are also a lot of pagan rituals that are associated with, uh, with the Hajj. And a lot of Muslims will agree to that. Most of them won't, but it is true. You have... A lot of things that happen when you come to the Kaaba, for example, you circumambulate around the Kaaba. They walk in circles. By the way, it's kind of cool to see because if you're a Muslim, you've prayed your whole life towards the Kaaba. So here in the United States, if it's time to pray, you'd find which direction is east. Um, and you would, if you had a compass, you'd pull that out and you'd figure out where the Kaaba is and you pray in that direction. Um, Muslims now have iPhone apps to do that. 
um, which I didn't have in my day. We didn't have iPhones in my day. Um, but they would, they would figure out where it is. Um, so all around the world, people are pointing towards the Kaaba. Well, when you look at the Kaaba, they're all looking kind of right there. So it's pretty cool to see. It's the only place where you kind of see that. Um, and so what Muslims do during the Hajj, they'll circumambulate the Kaaba. They'll do other rituals. There's an uh, area where they throw stones at Satan. These are, these are stone pillars, and they'll throw stones at them. And they'll run back and forth between Safa and Marwa. So if you look at the end there, that long hallway type thing, that is going between two hills. Uh, Safa and Marwa are the name of the hills. And pagans used to run back and forth between those hills. Um, and it's about half a mile, by the way, to give you a little bit of a scale there. So we have imported some pagan rituals into the Hajj. Um, there's also the kissing of the black stone. Uh, for those of you who know, there is a, a rock on the corner of the Kaaba, and it's said to have come from the heavens. And they have this in the corner of the Kaaba. People would come up to it, and they would kiss the stone um, for blessings. This happens before Islam comes on the scene. Honestly, understanding Islamic theology, I have no idea why Muslims still do it. Um, and one of the four caliphs, Umar, said the same thing. He said, I would not kiss the black stone were it not for the fact that I saw Muhammad doing it. Um, so it doesn't really fit the theology, but they do do it. And it dates back to pre-Islamic days. So here's the Hajj. It is extremely important for Muslims. A lot of Muslims, especially folk Islam, uh, in other words, it's not really found in the theology, but people practice this anyway. They will say that going to the Kaaba will forgive all of your sins. If you, the first time you see the Kaaba, all your sins will be forgiven. Other people permutate that. If you go on Hajj, whenever you go on Hajj, your sins will have been forgiven. A lot of people in the Middle East actually plan to go to the Kaaba to die because they want their sins to be forgiven right before they die, so they go into heaven, um, which is not uncommon. Um, Constantine did a similar thing. He was baptized right before he died for that reason. Uh, so what you have here is a little bit of focus law mixed in, but it's extremely important to Muslims. Um, yeah, I think that's all I could, should say about that. Oh, well, I guess I could point out, this picture was taken during a Hajj, and each dot you see there is a person. And you have approximately five million people in this picture. So people come from all over, and there are trampling deaths that happen almost every year. Um, about 100 or so people to 300 people, pretty much, will, will die during the trampling deaths, and it's often seen as an honor. Um, and that's because during Safa and Marwa, when you're running back and forth, there aren't just, it's not just a straight run. There are moments you stop, moments where you run, and people will often get trampled in that. And there's sometimes when there's, there's a field, and there's tons and tons of people in a field um, during the various steps of the Hajj, and during that time there have been trampling deaths as well. So uh, it's very important to Muslims. There's some at risk when they go, but it really, really matters to them. It's the fifth pillar of Islam, and it's something that a lot of people aspire to doing during their lifetimes. Both my parents have done the Hajj, um, and they went and spent their whole time praying that I would become a Muslim again. So uh, it is extremely important. Any questions on the five pillars, by the way? Yes? Well, I have one on the Hajj. Have, have they ever justified how they could wrap pagan worship into only worshiping God? The best answer, I think the most honest answer, is that Muhammad did it. And that's it? And that's about it. Um, I have heard other responses, but they don't seem convincing. I think the people who are saying them aren't even convinced by them. Um, for example, some people say that uh, the method used to honor God, doesn't, it doesn't matter if that was a method used to honor multiple gods in the past or the wrong god in the past. And I guess that's legitimate thinking, um, but still the tradition came out of pagan roots and it's not connected to Islamic roots. Um, so. It's murky, but generally speaking, and from the time of Omar himself, the reason why this is done is because Muhammad did it. Yes? Um, regarding the fasting, as you mentioned that some places honor or uh, give time so they can restructure the time period, how does that work out and what, what uh, strength did they have in terms of allowing that to happen as they always try to say that we cannot uplift religion or the government cannot back up religion? That's a good question, and it gets more into the political side of things. I try to stay away from the political side of things, because once you get in it, you're stuck. Um, but uh, I will say this, because I think it's true. When people say you can't impose your religion upon others, generally they mean you can't 
impose the prevailing religion upon others, or the one that's espoused by the most people, which translates to Christianity. Um, so take your Christmas trees down, you know, don't put your cross up there, take out the Ten Commandments. Um, but if it's Islam, well, let's talk about Muhammad in class. Let's, let's teach Muhammad. There was actually a class, um, I think it was in, was it here in California? Maybe it was, I'm not sure where. Um, where the teacher was making her students recite the Shahada and making them perform the Salat. Um, was that California? Crazy Californians. Um, don't they say like California's gonna drift out to the ocean sometime? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, really, that's the way I think it happens. I'm not sure if it's simply because, hey, it's Christianity and this is Satan, like, you know, fighting against the truth, could be, or if it's just because our society's gotten to this point of political correctness where whatever is in charge has to be brought down. Um, could be that too. I think the two are working synergistically though. Yeah. Just a quick question about tithing. Mm -hmm. understand for Muslims, duty is extremely important. And so if they have a duty, they're gonna to try to fulfill it if they're devout. Um, and a large majority of them are trying to, if they're not truly devout, they're trying to keep up appearances. Um, and so they'll do it anyway. Uh, let me put it this way. I, from what I have seen personally, tithing is more of an issue with Christians <laughs> than it is with Muslims. Um, they're more willing to do it. Um, but at the same time, there are provisions in the Quran. If you can't afford it, then you can be on the receiving end. So again, these, a lot of this money goes to help the poor, and you can be on the receiving end for that. Uh, for example, my mother, um, when she wanted to um, celebrate my sister's wedding, she paid for the wedding of a poor person in Pakistan. So she paid for my sister's wedding, and to honor God through that, she paid for the wedding of a poor person in Pakistan. Um, and it's, you know, it's to honor God. And they really think that they're storing for themselves treasures in heaven by doing that. That's a good question. Um, it depends on how rich you are. Um, some people have better accommodations than others. A large number of them just stay out um, in fields and tents during that portion of the Hajj, uh, especially the more poor persons. But a lot of what you see around here are hotels. So a lot of the big buildings you see here are hotels, um, and so they'll stay there as well. It depends on the portion of the Hajj and the wealth of the person. Uh, one thing they all do, men will shave their heads. So you'll see all men shaving their heads and they're wearing two white garments. So you'll see a lot of white here, that's because they're all wearing white. They're, they're ritually preparing themselves. And you see the shaving of heads in the Bible too. It's like, hey, we're, you know, sackcloth and ashes and heads shaven, um, something similar to that. Sir. Now, how do they venerate the black stone today? I, Still the same. They, so you have millions of people that are kissing it just one by one as they go around? It can be worse than that. Um, some, people, some people have body parts that aren't functioning properly. They'll try to rub them on there. Uh, some, <laughs> some women are barren, and uh, you can infer at will. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting, but people have to push and shove to get up to the black stone. Um, and uh, it is considered a blessing. Uh, my dad said he kissed it. Uh, I don't think my mom kissed it. I think she touched it. Um, but yeah, they, they really try hard to do that. Is it considered a meteorite or is it I've heard different things about where it came from? Yeah, so uh, most Muslims will think it is a celestial rock. It was sent by God for some reason or another. Muslims who say it's a meteorite don't feel like that in any way contradicts anything. My parents always taught me it was a meteorite. Um, so yeah, some Muslims believe it's a meteorite, some don't. I would say the Muslims that I've interacted with in the West, an overwhelming majority of them do think it's a meteorite. Sir. Uh, yeah, let's hold that off for the last day. By the last day, I mean the last day I'm here, not... <laughs> <laughs> just, just to clarify. Are men and women separated during this time? Or do they are in the mosque? 
That's a good question. I think they're supposed to be. One of the levels here, you can see there's multiple levels here. One of the levels here, are multiples, of the, I'm not entirely sure, um, are, are designed for women. But I do know that women go up to the black stone, and so do men. Um, so I'm not sure what the rules are for segregation. I, I haven't really gotten that. Good question, though. I'll look into that. Ma'am? Yeah. Is this an event that's scheduled like once a year, or? Uh, yeah. So the Hajj happens a specific number of days after Ramadan ends. I think I said that right. So it's once a year. It's for 10 days long. And there are very specific events that happen during that time. Now, people can do those things the rest of the year. It's called Umrah. It's not called Hajj. And people go for Umrah regularly. It's a lot easier. Um, there's not as many people there. It's easier to get accommodations. Um, uh, but if you go during that specific time of the year and do those specific events with those people, that is called Hajj. And that's what Muslims are charged to do at least once in their lifetimes as the fifth pillar. Ma'am, did you have a question? Well, we went to an interfaith, well, was it sort of a conference, and we did go to the mosque here in, in La Mirada. And when we signed in, and I, it just struck me as really odd. They wanted to know our origin, hmm. where we were from. And I thought that, I mean, you know, you usually sign your name, your address, your email, your telephone number, but origin, and then everybody had to introduce themselves as to their ancestry. You know, that is extremely common. Um, we are kind of in a bubble. When you think uh, to the rest of the world, in preliterate times, people were identified based on who they were taught by, where they lived, where they came from. Um, and it wasn't until knowledge could travel, it wasn't until people that weren't tied to knowledge. In other words, in order for you to learn something before there's writing, you have to hear somebody say it. So you're automatically tied to that person. Um, and so you have this direct lineage um, that connects you to your past. Now we can just read things um, and we can just learn them and move on and we can go anywhere um, and you can accumulate a lot of knowledge as a young person. That's why we don't respect old people as much as we used to. Um, you know, so th things have changed a lot. And so you've got people who are coming from these preliterate societies, not to say that no one there has learned how to read, but the, the majority of people function on a preliterate, in a preliterate manner. And so they're connected to their heritage and their past that way. It just struck us, it struck me as, as odd because then we had, I had to stop and think, you know, of, you know where our, our family came from. And we're <laughs> so mixed up. It, it's, you know, we're all Heinz 57 now. <laughs> and it was like, why do they want to know this? It's, you know. Yeah, it used to identify people a lot more. And that's why the genealogies are not as important to us as they used to be. Um, so we, when we read them, we should put on the glasses of, you know, a preliterate person reading it and understanding, wow, that's where they're getting their identity from. Um, so, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point to bring up. My mom always taught me to introduce myself as Nabil, son of Amjad, um, and, you know, I was supposed to know my family lineage a certain number of degrees back. Uh, in fact, when I would go to large gatherings uh, with Muslims, they would, they would not ask me first, you know, what do you do? Which is what we often ask. Who's your father? Who was his father? And like, oh, I remember him. I met him, blah, blah, blah. You're his grandson. You're a good boy. You know, and they don't know anything about you. <laughs> but, you know, you're identified by who you came from. Anything else before we move past the five pillars onto the six articles of faith? Yeah. The black box, you said the name for it is? The Gaaba. Gaaba? Gaaba. K-A apostrophe A-B-A. Or K-A apostrophe B-A. Mm -hmm. Do you know the history behind that and how it ended up in Mecca and where that like, story, what the story is behind that? Good question. So Muslims believe that Ishmael um, is their ancestor. And when Abraham came and dropped off Hagar and Ishmael, mm -hmm. he did it here. Um, and the pathway, by the way, um, that people run back and forth between uh, they, they say that is where Hagar ran back and forth between two hills looking for help. Um, and uh, in the meantime, Ishmael is kicking his feet because he's a little baby. And uh, as he kicks his feet, a well of water springs up. And that's where she gets her well, the, the water from. They call that the Zamzam well. And they still have Zamzam water that everyone passes around and extremely holy. My dad brought big things of Zamzam water back to the United States. And he gave little jars of it to all of our relatives and they drank it and they thanked him. Um, 
even though we know it's not the same one. So, um, so yeah, this, this whole, and they have a little place here too, you can't see it in this picture, where Abraham's feet are supposedly imprinted in the ground. Um, so it's the little chamber of Abraham, and you can go see his feet imprinted in the ground. Um, so lots of ties back to Abraham here. How much of it is accurate? Well, the sheer fact that we don't have records going that far back is problematic. Um, literature didn't develop in Arabia. Uh, the Arabic script itself did not develop until the end of the fourth century or um, uh, into the fifth century. And there was no literature, even though the script had developed, there was no literature until the Quran. The Quran was the first book of Arabic literature. So we don't have records pre-Islamic except those that have been saved by Muslims and were written down after the inception of Islam. So you can only go but so far back. They did have other scripts that captured Arabic language, uh, but most of those were inscriptions on tombs and such. They weren't things that were capturing history or anything like that. Good question. So how, how does that work with the idea that nobody could have written something like this if they didn't have anything else written? Yeah, let's talk about that tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that with the Quran. Definitely bring that up. Okay, let's move on to the six articles of faith. So what we, what we just talked about were the five pillars. Understand, again, it, as far as Muslims are concerned, normally speaking, when you ask a Muslim to tell them about their Islamic life, they'll bring up the pillars first. Because to them, the actions matter more, relatively speaking, personally speaking, maybe not if they break it down, but in their lives, they matter more than their beliefs. Um, but some beliefs are fundamental. Uh, for example, the six articles of faith. These are the bases of Islamic theology. And they are pretty much in order of importance. Um, the first one is belief in Allah, or belief in one God. Now, Muslims believe that their God is the true, the pure monotheistic image of God. Um, that the Jewish God even, and especially the Christian God, uh, have impurities and the Christian God has been divided. True, pure monotheism, according to Muslims, is Allah, the one God. Um, and the word Allah literally means the one with all qualities. It's very close to what you, how you could say the God. Uh, just for your benefit, Allah was the name of gods even before Muslims came on the scene. Uh, so there was an Allah before Muslims were around. Um, there were a ton of gods before Muslims were around. Uh, but Muhammad said no to the rest of them and he said yes to Allah. Allah was already the chief god amongst the pagans. Um, at least that's what they say. <coughs> Here's a quotation about the <coughs> nature of Allah in the Quran. Surah 59, a surah basically means chapter, it has a deeper meaning, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but basically it means chapter. 59, verses 22 through 24. God is he than whom there is no other God, who knows all things, both secret and open. He, most gracious, most merciful. God is he than whom there is no other God, the sovereign, the holy one, the source of peace and perfection, the guardian of faith, the preserver of safety, the exalted in might, the irresistible, the supreme. Glory to God. High is he above the partners they attribute to him. He is God, the creator, the evolver, the bestower of forms. To him belong the most beautiful names. Whatever is in the heaven and on the earth doth declare his praises and glory. And he is the exalted the might, in might, the wise. This was the Yusuf Ali translation. So here we have a lot of descriptions of Allah. Um, generally speaking, when you learn about Allah in the Quran, it's in this way. It's through these names of Allah. And you'll see Muslims list out 99 names of Allah or 100 or 98, what have you, uh, usually around that number, names of Allah that they extract from the Quran and a few from Hadith to tell you about God. They do think though that God is unknowable, that he's transcendent, and that these words are the best approximation that we can have about God. God is so far and so above everything that we know that you can't really know what God is like. That is partially derivative from the fact that Muhammad never actually spoke directly to Allah, according to many Muslims. Um, he spoke through the angel Gabriel. Uh, now, there are different types of revelation, according to Muslims, called wahi, um, and it happened in different ways. If you look at the hadith 
And we'll talk about that some tomorrow. Uh, but that said, even though he was being inspired by God, he didn't have this direct communication with him for the most part. Most Muslims don't think so anyway. And so Allah is that far and above beyond everyone else. Uh, the idea that God would come into this world is extremely degrading, according to Muslims. It's humiliating. It's far above. I mean, God is far above anything like that. He's far more majestic. He's worth so much more. He thinks Christians um, are, are, they think Christians are humiliating their God by saying that he became a man, which is true. <laughs> um, that is what God did according to the Christian faith. Um, so it's something that we should be able to explain. Other than that though, God is not to be known relationally in Islam. Uh, there is a verse in the Quran, um, I didn't bring it here, but I'll bring it tomorrow, where basically it says God has no son. He has no children. And so for Muslims in the West, often they'll say God is our father. That is something that they've imported from Christianity. It's not at all found in the Quran, quite the opposite. It says God has no children. Um, one of the chief verses of the Quran, one of the chief chapters of the Quran is chapter 112 of the Quran, which makes that point abundantly clear. We'll talk about that a bit more tomorrow as well. So that is Allah in a nutshell. He is the God that Muhammad preached, and he preached him mainly by describing him. Another of the six articles of faith are the angels, or the unseen. Muslims believe that you have to have belief in the unseen. There are things that you don't see that are extremely important. Angels are one of them. Muslims believe that angels exist on both shoulders. One angel recording all your good deeds, the other angel recording all your bad deeds. Um, I used to remember hoping as a child that this angel wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Um, I was hoping this one was a lot more attendant to me. Um, angels will usher you into heaven or hell. Uh, angels will inform you as you're in the grave as to whether you'll be going to heaven or hell. Uh, angels have a large part to play. The unseen um, has a large part to play in Islam. Jinn are constantly mentioned in the Quran. Jinn. It's where you get J-I-N-N. -N. It's where you get the English word genie from. And it's often translated demons, uh, but a closer Translation would probably be unseen beings. So that's extremely important for Muslims as well, especially in folk Islam. The unseen is extremely important. The prophets play a pivotal role in Islam. Again, we've talked about how Muslims envision Islam as being the faith that Allah has sent to the world over time, and that people have corrupted it, and that the one prophet who um, brought it all back in was Muhammad. Let's take a look at chapter 2, verse 136 of the Quran. Say, O Muslims, we believe in Allah and that which is revealed unto us, and that which was revealed and that which was revealed unto Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, and that which Moses and Jesus received, and that which the prophets received from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and unto him we have surrendered. Think about this for a second. What they're saying is they follow all the prophets, and you'll hear that in Islamic discussions. We follow all the prophets, why don't you follow our prophet? That's what they'll often say. Uh, we respect all the prophets, why don't you respect Muhammad? They honestly think that every prophet who has come has taught Islam in some way, shape, or form, that they were all Muslim, and that all people throughout all time who followed those prophets were Muslim until those messages were corrupted, and then they became their own little thing. However, Muhammad takes a special place. I mean, even though, even though we saw in 2.136 that there's not supposed to be any distinction between any of them. Muslims are not supposed to make any distinction between any of the prophets. Still we see in chapter 33, verse 40, Muhammad is not the father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. And Allah is everywhere of all things. This, the word seal there is khatam. It's called khatam an nabiyin. And the idea is often translated the chief, or the best, or the ultimate. And Muslims treat Muhammad that way. Muhammad himself is called the exemplar in the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 21. He is the one that people are supposed to follow. He's, he's a good exemplar for them. Chapter 68, verse 4 says that his character is tremendous, that it is exalted. And so Muslims see Muhammad as the highest of prophets, the best, the greatest. You really cannot praise Muhammad highly enough, according to Muslims. If you talk to a Muslim about Muhammad, they will say that Muhammad was the most gentle person who ever walked the face of the earth. He would never hurt a thing. 
He was the most generous person. He gave generously. He had to sleep on the floor on a straw mat while he gave tremendously to the poor and to the widow and to the orphan. That Muhammad was the champion of women's rights, that he instituted uh, the rights for women in an oppressed nation. That he was the one who established worship of the one true God in a pagan society, even at the face of persecution and death. That Muhammad was the ultimate statesman, that he was able to establish an empire that existed for well over a thousand years after he passed. And that he was the perfect general, that he was able to win many battles and conquer a nation, even though he started all by himself. These are the kinds of superlatives that Muslims will say to, about Muhammad. And then they'll turn that around and they'll say, look, we can know how to live our lives because we have an exemplar who showed us how to do all kinds of things. He lived in all walks of life. He was extremely poor. He was extremely rich. He was married to one woman. He was married to many women. He was uh, not influential at all. He was extremely influential. He walked all walks of life and therefore we can follow him and we know how we're supposed to live our lives. That is how a Muslim will often provide a picture of Muhammad. You really cannot praise him highly enough. Uh, I'll give you another example. When I was going to Sunday school um, as a Muslim, uh, which we had on Saturday, but we still called Sunday school. Um, we, uh, we were taught by, a, now my parents had generally taught me kind of an, a, a Pakistani Indian version of Islam, but for this Sunday school I was, I was being taught by an Egyptian. Um, and he, he had some different stories for me. And uh, one story was, Muhammad never could have cried. And this was new, and I said, what are you talking about? And he says, if Muhammad were to have cried, the land would have become infertile. And so he never cried. And I was like, do you really believe that? <laughs> Even as a Muslim, I was kind of, I don't think that's true because uh, Muhammad's sons died, right? He had two sons that were born and they both died as infants, uh, extremely young as babies. Um, I can't imagine that he didn't cry at that time. That's what I was thinking. Uh, he's, he has compassion. Um, so. Anyhow, you have, you have folk Islamic stories coming from all over, but a lot of them really exalt Muhammad to the highest level. Uh, and that is why it's really something to tread carefully uh, about. When Muslims are talking to you about Muhammad, unless you have their total respect and trust, I wouldn't broach that issue. I wouldn't talk about Muhammad right away. Uh, that's something to wait on. Um, because it, by doing that, you are tearing down bridges and potentially alienating them from hearing the gospel. And everything you say to them can all of a sudden have an inimical flavor. So uh, be careful talking about Muhammad. Now, if you have someone who's more than comfortable talking about him, that's a different story. But just be careful. The next of the six articles of faith are the Holy Scriptures. Now, Muslims believe that God sent to these prophets, some of them anyway, scriptures which were inspired by God. Muslims often envision that the process was similar to the Quran. The Quran was sent to Muhammad through dictation. So according to Muslims, God dictated the Quran to Gabriel. Gabriel then dictated the Quran to Muhammad. So Muhammad heard word for word from God, everything it was inspired. That's the hardest level of inspiration there is. Um, Christians have lower levels of inspiration. Either they believe that God spoke through Paul and uh, Luke and John, etc., that he spoke through them, um, or that their word, you, if you have a lesser view of inspiration, or that their words are roughly inspired by God insofar as they're um, inspired uh, by message, not word for word. Um, so, but no Christian that I know of has a hard dictation image of the inspiration of the scripture. But Muslims often envision the original New Testament or the original Torah in Injil to have been inspired in that way, in this kind of dictated manner. Um, and so when they look at the New Testament today, many Muslims say, wait a minute, this is the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to John. Where's the gospel given to Jesus? Um, and so they'll say that today's gospel is not the gospel the Quran is talking about. Interesting. Um, but all, you generally have people saying the books, most Muslims will say that the books were originally inspired, that the Torah that we have today was inspired, the New Testament we have today, most Muslims would say that was the inspired word of God, but at some point the message came and it was corrupted and it's no longer trustworthy. The Quran, on the other hand, is a different story. Yeah. Uh, I was going to question that on the Quran. It has, it has changed or has not changed? <laughs> We'll be talking about that a lot tomorrow. 
Surah 543 tells us, how come they unto thee for judgment when they have the Torah, wherein Allah hath delivered judgment for them? Yet even after they turn away, I'm sorry, even after that they turn away, such folk are not believers. What is this saying? The Jews are asking Muhammad for judgment for some reason, we don't know what. And the response from Allah at that moment is, why are they coming to you to ask for judgment when they themselves have guidance sent by me, the Torah? A similar sentiment is found just three verses later regarding the gospel. And we caused Jesus, son of Mary, to follow in their footsteps, confirming that which was revealed before him in the Torah. And we bestowed on him the gospel, wherein is guidance and a light, confirming that which was revealed before it in the Torah, a guidance and an admonition unto those who ward off evil. So in other words, what this is saying here is the Christians have a book called the Injil. They are supposed to go to it too. And he says that, it says it a little bit more clearly over the next few verses. So they believe in inspired books, but they believe that they have been corrupted. When did that belief come about? A few centuries after Muhammad. Muslims began to take a look at the books and they began to realize, wait a minute, these things are teaching doctrine very differently from what the Quran teaches. <coughs> so they say these must have been corrupted. Before that, there is a detectable difference in what Muslims believed. They believe that they were the inspired word of God and that God's word could never be corrupted. In fact, that seems to be what the Quran teaches. Um, if you take a look at chapter five, verses 46 through 48, so this being the first one, the next two verses, um, you take a look at chapter five, verse 66 through 68, it really seems that the Quran teaches that people at that time still had the word of God, it wasn't corrupt, and Allah expected Jews and Christians to still use the word, which is what it seems like right here. Chapter six, verse 115 of the Quran says that the word of God can never be changed. And so it, it seems to be an innovation in Islamic thought that the scriptures were corrupt, an innovation that came a few years later, sir. So when you're speaking with Muslims, would they say, would you say, well, God inspired those scriptures and he, for whatever reason, allowed them to become corrupted. Why is the Quran any different? And how do you know that the Quran didn't become corrupted? God's word that was inspired previously became corrupt, corrupted. How is the Quran any different? They argue that the Quran has been perfectly preserved from the day it was dictated to Muhammad to today, nothing has been changed. Not a jot, not a tittle, nothing. It's exactly the way it was when Muhammad received it. Um, and you ask him for their evidence and we'll talk about that stuff tomorrow. Sir. The, the first thinker that I know who says it um, doesn't say that until the ninth century. So that's two, 200 years later. Um, but I mean, there may be ones that said it earlier, but I haven't seen any. And no Muslim has brought one to me. I can't remember the name right now. I'll bring that to you tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Um, this is Allah speaking, correct? Correct. That's a great question. And what an average Muslim will tell you is that Allah is speaking in the royal we. Um, he's speaking for himself, for the state, etc. And so it's kind of the royal we as a queen of England would, would use. Um, so that's what most Muslims would say. I have the feeling that it's that way because in certain passages of the Old Testament, God spoke in first person plural. Um, and Muhammad is trying to emulate some of that. Um, but I can't verify that. There's, there's a degree of uncertainty there. So we should be careful with that, sir. Is there a Muslim belief on how Allah dictated the, the Torah and the Gospels? Like, did they have an idea of he came down to this person or he sent an angel to this person and dictated that to them? Yeah, the Quran says that the Torah and the Injil were dictated. I'm sorry, that the Quran was given to Muhammad as the Torah and the Injil were. And so there's no distinction given in the manner of dictation generally speaking, by the Quran. Now, Muslims today will say uh, that it may have been different, but that's usually part of an apologetic argument. It's not something you find. Because it seems like everywhere I'm seeing, it's like Jesus received the gospel. 
which is what it says right here. Yeah, I don't know how they substantiate that. Like, there's, there's no, there's no evidence I think they see it the same way that, that uh, Muhammad received the Quran from Gabriel. That's how they're seeing it with Jesus. But they don't necessarily go through and say who did it, when did it happen, what angel was it, etc. You, you don't see that. Great questions. Yes, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, one more. Or two more, I guess. It says, and we caused Jesus and Mary to follow in their footsteps. But if God's in heaven and they're on earth, isn't that God's spirit who caused them to walk in those footsteps? Sure. I mean, I think that's all implied. Like the Holy Spirit? The, the level of precision in language today, we cannot anachronistically retroject onto then. We speak far more precisely than they used to. Um, and we write even more precisely. So when it says we cause Jesus, it could, be, it could be the Spirit, it could be God sending an angel, it could be one of many, we would only speculate. That said, the Spirit of God shows up a lot in the Quran. Um, and so you'll see the Spirit of God doing all kinds of things in the Quran. Does that mean the Holy Spirit the way Christians envision it? No. Uh, Muhammad envisioned it differently. Uh, but you do see the Spirit of God. It's really the same question as the first. I guess, again, my question to it then would be, why would God allow his word to be corrupted, period? It's his, it's his word. There's no difference in the sense that it's inspiration, it's authority. And again, the whole issue, the whole argument of corruption is something that's brought up in polemics. It's not brought up by the Quran itself. And so they'll offer whatever subjective reason they'll come up with, uh, but it's not substantiated from the text. The texts seem to say very clearly that God f will protect his word. I don't think there's any two ways about chapter 6, verse 115. There's one verse in the Quran which says that the Jews had exchanged their scripture for a lie. And Muslims will, who are taking this position in polemics will say, look, they had you know, changed the words around. Um, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, instead of following the scripture, they followed a lie. One last question and we'll move on. Saw it in the corner there. Uh, so you brought up the question about we, and I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. This would be the angel Gabriel talking to Allah. Yes, but he's dictating word for word what Allah told him, okay. according to Muslims. Um, and what Allah told him is found inscribed on an eternal tablet, uh, the law e mafuz. So most Muslims believe that the Quran is preserved on a tablet in heaven for all, for all of time, and therefore the Quran itself is eternal. Uh, it coexists as the eternal word of God. Um, that's what most Muslims believe about the Quran. The law e mafuz. I think that's uh, chapter 85. Yeah, chapter 85, verses 21 through 22. Interestingly, Jesus is also called the Word of God in the Quran, Kalamatullah, um, but it's a different idea. Um, the idea there, at least as explained by Muslims today, is when it comes to Jesus, virgin birth, God simply said, kun fayakun, he said, be, and it was. And so Jesus was made by the word of God. And so Muslims will often say Jesus is the word in that sense. Uh, that is a modern explanation of why the Quran says it, though. It's not something I've seen in the Quran itself. So the Quran, then, as opposed to the Torah and the Injil, the Quran is the ultimate guidance for Muslims. I mean, this is the one that they'll turn to. They won't turn to the Torah. They won't turn to the Injil ever. They'll go to the Quran. Even, even the Muslims who still believe the Torah and the Injil are the word of God, they'll go to the Quran, because why go to those when you have the ultimate word here? This was the one that was designed for all people. Muhammad's ministry started in 610. It wasn't public at that time. It didn't go public for the next three years or so. Uh, but in 610 AD, Muhammad received the first revelation of the Quran. A uh, very interesting story. I'll give you the Islamic version now. Uh, as far as Islamic, I mean... Remember, right now what we're discussing is the way modern Muslims see Islam. Uh, later we're going to take a more critical look. But the way modern Muslims see the first revelation is Muhammad is fasting and praying in a cave. This cave is called Ghare Hira, or the Cave of Hira. Muhammad is a monotheist. Even though everyone around him is a pagan or a polytheist, Muhammad is a monotheist. And so he goes to this cave, 
and he, he sits there and prays for 40 days. And in this time, an angel comes, Gabriel, and he embraces Muhammad. And he says, recite. Muhammad being unlearned, unlettered, illiterate, has never done this before. He's never had this process of reciting back to a teacher. And so he says, I don't know how to recite. So the angel embraces him again and says, recite. Three times the angel embraces him and says, recite. Finally, Muhammad says, what then shall I recite? And the angel says, Ikra bi ismi rabbika lazi khalak. Recite in the name of your Lord who created you. This is the first revelation of the Quran. Muhammad comes out of there. He's afraid. He's frightened. Uh, he doesn't know what's going on. It takes him a few years to finally realize that he is the chosen prophet of Islam. So three years later, he starts his public ministry. But the Quran started in 610 AD, and it goes all the way until his death in 632. The moment he dies, the Quran stops. It is a common Muslim belief that the last verse to be revealed of the Quran was, today we have completed for you your religion, which is a verse found in the Quran. However, it's not true, and Muslim scholars will say today that that's not true. That wasn't the last verse. The last verse was just whatever happened to be the last verse before he died. The process was progressive revelation. It wasn't like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what, you know, what have you, where someone sat down and wrote out the gospel. Um, at some point or another, anyway, you have some people who argue that Mark was written through oral means, but apart from that, it wasn't written down at one point, the Quran. It was brought down piecemeal. When Muhammad would be talking to Jews, all of a sudden a revelation would come where he'd say, this is what Allah says, and he'd recite it to them. And that recitation would then later be used in liturgy, and it would be called Quran, a recitation. The word Quran itself means the recited. Um, and so what that might mean, what that might have implications for, uh, some Muslims say that it means the most recited book. And it very well may be the most recited book. Um, when Muslims pray the Salat, you remember them praying five times a day? Of that they pray multiple rakats, or multiple uh, standing and bowing postures. Uh, for example, the Fajr Salat is two Fard rakats and two Sunnah rakats, so you have to pray at least two rakats. Um, the Zohar prayer, the next one, is at least four, but I was taught to do four Fard, four Sunnah, and two more Sunnah, so ten rakats. At the least, if you're praying, um, the, the salat the way you ought to, uh, well, the way I prayed the salat, I was taught to recite portions of the Quran over 30 times a day, all from memory. Whole segments of the Quran. I mean, that's why I had to memorize so many chapters as a kid, was I had to have chapters to recite. At the end of the, the first and second rakah, you often have to recite sections of the Quran. You get to pick, it's your choice, but sections that you like, and I often recited that surah, surah 112. Um, because, you know, it was a short one, it was easy to remember, it rhymed. And so I recited that one over and over and over again. And so Muslims are reciting the Qur'an extremely regularly. And so when Muslims say that the word the Qur'an means the often recited, they have a basis for that. It is probably the most recited book in the world. Um, another meaning that it has is the recitation. Uh, you have some scholars who argue that the term was found in Syriac before it was found in Arabic. In fact, the word Quran was first used in Arabic in the Quran. Um, we don't have any records of it being used anywhere else, uh, even oral records of that word being used anywhere else. In Syriac, it was used by Christians to mean liturgy that was read aloud in church settings, which is pretty much exactly what the Quran is used for in Salat. It's liturgy that's read aloud in prayer. Um, so, doesn't really matter all that much where the word comes from for our purposes, but extremely interesting um, history of the word Quran there. Yeah. So, so when a Muslim prays, they don't really personally pray asking, they always recite, or do they also personally speak? The, the five <laughs> daily prayers, the Salat, are all prescribed prayers. Word for word, you are saying what you were taught to say. Standing, bowing, doing things with your hands the way you were taught. Some Muslims insert extemporaneous prayers in those prayers. So, for example, my family had taught me during the sajda, where you've got your, your head to the ground, you can then ask God for whatever you want. Um, most Muslims, though, would ask God for what they want afterwards. Um, and they would, after the salat is done, then they would do the wa. They would lift their hands up, and they would pray extemporaneously at that point. My parents always kind of laughed at that. They said, when do you ask someone for something, while you're in the house or after you leave the house? Um, I thought that was very clever. So, yeah.
there's a difference between Salat and Dua. And a lot of the Dua is also pre-memorized. My mom had taught me a slew of Duas that came from Hadith, or that came from the Quran. Um, uh, before I used to speak, my mom, um, I used to give speeches as a kid, my mom said, recite this prayer. And it was the prayer in the Quran that Moses recited to Allah when he would have to speak to the Pharaoh. So she told me to be able to recite this. And I memorized it. I didn't know what it meant. It was in Arabic, but I memorized it because my mom told me to. And, you know, that's, that's how Muslims pray often, even through, even through prescribed prayers. Yep. Yeah, it really doesn't. There's a disconnect there. Um, most Muslims would respond to that f by saying that Allah can hear everything. And so even though you can't know him, he can know what you're saying. Uh, what really is interesting, though, is if Allah has predetermined everything, which he really has, according to Islam, we'll see that shortly. If he's predetermined everything, then what point is there to pray? Um, and mostly, from what I've seen, pray prayer is done by Muslims to please Allah. Um, it, to make him happy, at least the Salat. And, and the Dua is more of an expression of one's own heart. Um, but different Muslims would have different answers to that. The issue of predetermination of Allah being able to listen to you and do things uh, based on you is a very tricky issue in Islam. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So you have to understand then, the Quran came piecemeal at times, at certain points, and Muhammad would say, according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad would say, this recitation, put this in that surah. This recitation here, put it over here before these verses. And so what you have then is a book that's being built up over time. Uh, certain portions of the Quran were later removed. Muhammad would say, you remember I said this? Well, that's not part of the Quran anymore. Allah has abrogated that, now this is part of the Quran, and he'd replace it with something else. That's called the doctrine of abrogation. It's found in chapter two, verse 106 of the Quran, and chapter 16, verse 101 of the Quran. We'll, recover, we'll recap this tomorrow too, in case you miss any of these points. Um, so at times, Muhammad, uh, I'm sorry, Allah would supplement teachings or replace teachings through this doctrine of abrogation. It's called naskh in Arabic, N-A-S-K-H. All of this was said to be revealed directly by God to the prophet. So you know how we can say John wrote his gospel, Mark wrote his gospel. If you were to say Muhammad wrote the Quran, a Muslim would get infuriated because Muhammad didn't write it. It was Allah who wrote it. Muhammad was just a conduit through which it came. Doctrine of, doctrine of it's called. Doctrine of abrogation. Abrogation. Nasch, N-A-S-K-H, Nasch. Um, it's called uh, Al-Nasikh wal Mansukh, that which abrogates and that which has been abrogated. Um, and we'll be talking about that a lot more in detail tomorrow. Of the Quran, modern Muslims will say this, again, received from whyislam.org. The Quran's message is eternal and universal transcending our differences in race, color, ethnicity, and nationality. It provides guidance on every aspect of human life, from economics and ethics of trade to marriage, divorce, gender issues, inheritance, and parenting. So according to modern Muslims, the scope of the Quran is infinite, and really that's what they'll say. The more humankind learns and understands and grows, the more they'll be able to get out of the Quran. Uh, the Quran is a deep trove of treasures. On the preservation of the Quran, here's what whyislam.org has to say. The Quran is unique because it is the only revealed book that exists today in the precise form and content in which it was originally revealed. Furthermore, it was actively recorded during the time the religion was being established. So they will juxtapose the Quran with the Torah, the Injil, and say this one, the Quran, is perfectly preserved. It's the only one. It's unique in that it exists today in the precise form in which it has been revealed. Again, we're taking a look today at how Muslims see their religion. Uh, it's very hard for me to not say something right now, <laughs> but, but we'll wait till tomorrow. 
Now, as far as the inspiration of the Quran, people give a lot of reasons to defend it. Uh, first, the one we've already talked about, the Quran is inimitable in style. You cannot copy it, you cannot write anything like it, you could not produce something similar to it, no matter how hard you try, no matter who helps you, as soon as you try, you will realize you can't do it. And this challenge is issued five times in the Quran, three of uh, the challenges are up here. I chose these three because they have different scopes. Um, sometimes the Quran says, just try to write a book like it. Sometimes it says, try to write a chapter like it. Sometimes it says, try to write 10 chapters like it. You'll realize you can't. So the challenge to debunk the inspiration of the Quran always comes in this nature from the Quran, that it is literarily excellent beyond replication. But people today have all kinds of reasons that they use to defend the inspiration of the Quran, and probably one of the favorites out in the West is the science, the scientific knowledge that the Quran has. They would argue that the Quran has scientific knowledge that transcends what Muhammad could have possibly known. An example is found in chapter 78, verses 12 through 13, where it talks about the moon and the sun. And here the Quran is describing that the moon and the sun are sources of light. However, the word light is used for the moon and the word lamp is used for the Quran. I'm sorry, for the sun. Muslims will say that, look, a lamp produces light and the sun produces light. But the moon is just called a light according to the Quran, which shows us that it's not the same kind of light. Uh, it's a reflection of a real light. And people in that time didn't know that the moon reflected the light of the sun. This was advanced scientific knowledge. Therefore, it shows that the Quran is divinely inspired. Please hold your rebuttals. Um, the Quran also mentions the celestial orbits of the sun and the moon, that they are in orbit. Um, and how could Muhammad have known that the sun and the moon are in orbit? That's something we figured out only recently. Um, so that is another argument that's often provided. These are the astrological um, reasons, by the way. Also, it is said in chapter 51, verse 47, that the, the Quran can be translated by, as saying that the universe is still expanding. How could they have known about the expansion of the universe at that time? Clearly, scientific knowledge, advanced scientific knowledge that comes from God. I had a debate on this issue, by the way, back in 2009, and you can find that on my website. There are other points of scientific knowledge besides um, astrology. Astrology? Astronomy. I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> astronomy. Um, there's also geology, oceanography, biology, physiology, embryology, all kinds of things Muslims will point to. This field, you're going to ask me to spell it and I won't be able to even if I tried, um, of Islamic uh, argumentation for the Quran has a name. It's called Busaism. Um, and it's named after a man named uh, Dr. I think Martin Busai or Lawrence Busai, something, he's French. Um, and he wrote a book on the Quran and science. And he argues that the Quran has this miraculous scientific knowledge. And Muslims have taken his book and really popularized it, especially here. Um, and so a lot of people will use these arguments to show the Quran is divinely inspired. Yep. Before it was popularized by Lawrence, was this even something that they was being, you know, talked about? Or? It was being talked about. It has been being talked about for a while now. Okay. Don't know when it started. But what Busai did was he provided a book with a Western name on it and credentials. You know, he's a doctor. Um, and so in doing so, they say, look, even your scholars will agree that the Quran is divinely inspired because of the scientific knowledge in it. So Busai was not Muslim? I think he is now. He wasn't originally. I think he is now, if he's still alive. But after the writing of the book, I think uh, he became Muslim. Correct me if I'm wrong. There are also other um, scholars who did weigh in in favor of Islam, um, but there was a lot of controversy surrounding that. None of them became Muslims. Uh, you can look that up online as well. It's very controversial. They'll try to point to some of those names regularly. If you run across that, just look it up online. So we've talked so far about the Quran and the other books in the context of the six articles of faith. 
briefly now, there is the day of judgment which Muslims believe will happen. Jesus himself will return from a tower in Damascus is what most of them believe. He'll descend and he will initiate the latter days um, and he will impose Islam, don't forget he taught Islam. He will impose Islam around the world. He will destroy the crosses and he will kill the swine and people will begin to fight against non-Muslims. So Muslims will begin to fight against non-Muslims and non-Muslims will be killed left and right. Rocks will, will, hide, will cry out, there is a Jew hiding behind me, kill him um, in those days. Most of this comes from Hadith. It does not come from the Quran. And modern Muslims will often dismiss Hadith regularly if they disagree with their own brand of Islam. So it's hard to pin down Islamic eschatology and for that reason I have not really looked into it that much. If you do want to look into modern Islamic eschatology, there's a great scholar by the name of David Cook out of Rice University. He is um, a well-respected Islam scholar. So that's the day of judgment though. Ultimately all Muslims believe that they will be held, be held to account for their actions. Once their deeds are placed on a scale, if they have done more good deeds than bad deeds, they will be allowed into heaven. The soteriology is deeds based. Many Muslims do have a significant conception of grace though, but the grace plays into the deeds. For example, Allah can overlook some of your sins and he can multiply your good deeds if he so chooses. And in doing so, your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds. However, he kind of does that as he pleases. There's no telling really how Allah is going to do this. And that leads to the sixth article of faith, which is the supremacy of God's decree. Allah can write out for you and in fact has written out for you before you were born, whether you'd go to heaven and hell or hell, exactly how long you'd live, what your fortune and fate in this life would be, etc. Abu Bakr is recorded as having said, uh, Abu Bakr is one of the four caliphs, by the way, that Sunnis follow and Shia don't, um, well, one of the three that the Shia don't follow. Um, Abu Bakr, the, the next successor after Muhammad, Muhammad dies, Abu Bakr takes over the Islamic empire. He has been recorded as saying, that even if he were to have one foot in heaven, he would fear the deception of Allah. In other words, he's worried that God would throw him into hell, even if he already has a foot into heaven because that's what was written for him. Uh, more hadith are along those lines where it says that you can be very close to heaven and all of a sudden what Allah has written for you will take place and you will end up going to hell and vice versa. You can be extremely close to hell and what Allah has written for you uh, will come to be and you will go to heaven. So a very, very strong view, um, almost fatalistic view, uh, actually it is fatalistic view amongst most Muslims uh, as far as where you will be and what God's decree is. So even though there's grace uh, and even though there is this concept of undue mercy from Allah, ultimately it's a deeds-based faith and Allah can do what he wants. Ma'am. Sorry, I've heard the only assurance of salvation in Islam is through martyrdom. Is that true? That that's the only way you for sure know you're going to get into heaven? Depending on who you ask. For the most part, yes. Um, the only way to get to heaven is to die in jihad. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's a word that I probably shouldn't have said today. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait till Friday to talk, I'm, I'm sorry, till Saturday to talk about it more. Um, but generally speaking, Muslims agree that that is the way to assure entrance into paradise. There is another way that folk Islam teaches, which is if you die while on Hajj, mm -hmm. then you can go to heaven. Not, that's not something you see in the sources, or at least nothing I've seen. A third way is, um, is closed to everyone, which is uh, if you take, took part with Muhammad in the Battle of Badr, which is the first major battle fought by Muslims. Mm -hmm. Um, all 313 who took, battle, took part in Badr are supposed to have gone to heaven. Um, again, that's not something all Muslims believe. The universal one in there is pretty much if you die in jihad. Any other questions? Before, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to finish this out um, before the night. Jeff. Do they, um, does the Quran talk about what, uh, I guess, paradise is going to be like at all? The Quran does talk about paradise. Um, quite a bit. Again, I have not focused on Islamic eschatology, but some of the things that are said are that there will be gardens and rivers and fruits. The, the rivers will be made of wine. There'll be plenty of honey. Um, you will be given um, huris, 
which are often translated virgins. Um, a number is not specified. Um, so that's generally the image of, his, of uh, the afterlife in the Quran. The Hadith goes far more into detail. Um, and most of the Hadith are very sensual regarding what the afterlife is going to be like. Your senses are, uh, are really going to be uh, tickled in heaven, to say the least. Um, so, and in the afterlife in hell, similarly, you're going to be tortured. It's going to be very carnal torture. Um, your skin is going to be flayed off you uh, through whipping, and then uh, it'll be recreated to be flayed off again over and over. Um, women who were seductive and uh, ungrateful will be hung by their breasts from trees. And um, it's a very, very carnal image of hell and of heaven. But again, I'm no expert on that. I would read David Cook. The period of creation, it's interesting you should bring that up. That's one of the few, ah, I've got to press the button. Laptop, right that one, print it. Um, <laughs> see, I, I diffuse things. I you know, tell the TSA I'm diffusing things. Um, uh, so the, the view of creation, most of the Quran says six days. There is one place in the Quran where it appears like it's eight days. It doesn't say eight. It says there were three periods of creation. Two, two, and four days. Um, so Muslims will often tout the fact that there is no contradiction in the Quran. This is the primary one that's used to rebut that. Um, but explicitly stated is six days. And the ways Muslims will, res will often respond to that is by saying, who's to say there was no overlap between the two, two, and four? Um, so anyhow, six days of creation. A lot of what you see in, in the Bible is found I'm sorry, a lot of what you see in the Quran is found in the Bible in some way or, or shape or form. Uh, you've got the story of Noah, you've got the story of Adam, you've got the story of Moses, uh, of, of Job, of Lot, um, Jesus, of course. So um, there's a lot of parallels there. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.